Okay, guys, uh, back again for another another video. I'm totally unprepared for. Um, uh, I had the day off work today because um, I had to go to the follow up appointment with my uh, oral surgeon. Otherwise, they would have had me working. Um, afterwards, I, I went and did laundry over at my sister's house. I wish I had enough money. I wish I had a job that paid enough money that I could get my new washer dryer or get my old one fixed or whatever. Um, but um, I'm here today to thank Andrew for sending me some VCLT, big package of 10 CDs actually. I received in the mail the other day. Um, and uh, have listened to them all several times. And there's, there's no clunkers in here, once again. Um, you know, it's amazing because Andrew picks up this stuff and sends it off to me and to other people as well. But everything he sent to me, I'm talking entirely from strictly my own experience. Um, maybe that music's too loud. I don't know. What I hear, what comes out in the recordings are two different things. I'm going to turn that down. Um... But uh, I've, I've listened now, what did I get, about three days ago, I got the package, have listened exclusively, extensively now, to all these recordings. And Andrew's thing is that um, he doesn't necessarily intend to do it, but he sends me things I wouldn't buy for myself. But then when I, when I hear them, it's like, wow, that's really great stuff. Um, so my, you know, collection is definitely enhanced by things that I would look at on paper and say, ah, I'm not going to pick up this one because maybe the band is too big and I like smaller or something like that, you know? And yet, when I play it, it's fantastic. Um, some, some, a, a few classical things and jazz things. Um, sent me this Aaron Copeland Telarc CD. Um, says, you probably already have a recording of these pieces of these Copeland works, but maybe not these versions, plus these old uh, Telarc discs usually sound amazing, which is true. Telarc stuff always sounds good, as does this one. like that cover, too. Um, it's a very typical style, classical music album cover, even from before the CD age. And I love those. They always suck me into buy discs. Um, most of these pieces I didn't actually have, you know, I don't have the Copeland originals. I have other people in other versions um, copying these, or, which I have many classical compilation various artist CDs, where they'll take an excerpt of a piece but not play the whole piece, so you're not really getting the full effect of, of the musical piece. So no, I didn't have these before, and the interesting thing is, is not that long ago, uh, and Carms picked this up and talked about it. I bought a an album by Tremel Starks, the electronic keyboard player. It was an older album, but it was something that was new to me when I picked it up. Um, and he did kind of synthesizer renditions of Copeland works, um, and it's a really good album. And and actually on there he has this full length. I think it's like a 27 minute version of uh, Copeland piece Appalachian Spring which um, I had never heard before. And sure enough, here it is, the full-length version of this, you know, by orchestra. It's real interesting to hear that after only hearing the electronic version and liking it very much. Good choice and recommended. Um, I'm going to have to keep going off camera because I've got such a big stack here. Um, this, was, this was a nice thing. is is a classical compilation CD. Um, is this, who put this together? This looks like one of those, like, Reader's Digest things, but it's not. Um, it's, it's a, there's a nice booklet inside that goes through, um, the various, you know, it's various composers, various pieces, fantastic photos, historical info on the composers. It's called In Classical Mood, Shades of Autumn. <clears throat> this is a very unprofessional recording. Oh, damn it. You know what? Hold on a second. I gotta get rid of this. Very professional. 
Very professional. God damn it, you know. I, I never get phone calls until I do videos. I swear. I'll, days go by, not that the phone doesn't ring once. Um, and I'm not going to start this over. So here's this little note. This one is um, Classical Mood, Shades of Autumn. And Andrew said, I know autumn is your favorite time of year, and you seem to enjoy liner notes and packaging. Uh, I grabbed this, this one up. Um, he's right. You know, the thing that I like about this, too, is I have, like I said, a lot of classical compilation CDs, various artists, um, you know, not focusing on one artist, which is, you know, what this is. It's all different. Uh, Elgar, Ralph Vaughan Williams, Debussy, Prokofiev, Tchaikovsky, Vivaldi. The thing that I like about this one is a lot of times when they when they do these compilations, um, they'll say, oh, well, here's uh, from one of these four seasons. Oh, here's the autumn suite. And it's like a minute or two of the autumn suite. And it's like, if you don't know, you're like, is that is that it? Um, but on this one, it seems like they've taken the entire autumn suite because it's over 11 minutes long. Um, so it's the full autumn suite that they took from the four seasons, for instance, which is what I like. Uh, Grieg is on here, Most, Mozart's on here, Prokofiev, which I like the, you know, weirder stuff, the Prokofiev, uh, Elgar, um, yeah, this works, this is really nice, I, I have not seen these, um, well, yeah, I was gonna say in the stores, I don't go to stores anymore to, to buy, uh, I'm trying to find out when this was put together, this is such a nice, CRD Records, the, the funny thing is this very much looks like um, like a Reader's Digest thing, you know? They, they put together these fancy kind of packages. It's a really nice, really nice, really... You know, this is almost like, um, or better than actually, you know, the old album when you used to listen to music and stare at the album artwork and the covers and stuff. Um, you know, there's you can play the music and there's so much to read. Um, I don't know if you could, you know, this is over an hour. I don't even know if uh, you would get through the whole thing in one play. All the, all the notes. It's nice to have something to read about the music, though. Because, you know, with CDs being so small, a lot of times the booklets nowadays don't really include much information. Another winner. Um, Christian McBride. As Andrew says, this is an excellent CD. Uh, what I learned is this is his first solo album from 1994, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 1994. Um, and it's, uh, you know, not the first album he appeared on, uh, but it's his first one done under his, his own name. And to me, 94 isn't that long ago. And I, I, I you know, I, I always think of Christian McBride as a guy recently on, on the scene. But until I looked it up, I didn't realize he, he wasn't even born until 1972, which, you know, is amazing. If you think of him as an upright bassist, totally into jazz, by 72, jazz wasn't even on the radar anymore, if you really think about it, in terms of popular music. And when I got into ECM, he was like six or seven years old when I was a teenager getting into ECM. So it's, it's or barely a teenager, 1920, getting into ECM. And I don't know how he got into jazz so heavily that he became an upright bassist at a time that, you know, God, he would have been, you know, he would have been getting into music like in the 1980s when the new wave thing was going on. So it's an, it's really incredible that somebody from that generation is so steeped in, in, in the acoustic jazz, too. I mean, this is purely an acoustic album. His first solo album, I know him from playing with, you know, guys like Jack DeJunet, and you know, as a sideman, he's got an, an incredible career. Um, but I had no idea he was that young. I couldn't believe it. I did a double take when I saw that he was born in 1972. I'm, I'm amazed that anybody from that generation would really have a serious interest in acoustic jazz and kind of keep that whole vibe alive. It's a fun album. Uh, everybody on the album is known. Um, Roy Hargrove on trumpet. Joshua Redman on saxophone, Steve Ture on trombone, Cirrus Chestnut on, on piano, uh, Lewis Nash on drums, and there's a, a track called Splanky, which is um, a, a, a th it's three, just three basses, three upright basses, 
Uh, the other two bassists are obviously from an earlier generation. They both passed away now. Ray Brown and Milt Hinton, both of which have gone for a number of years now, and Christian McBride on upright bass playing this fun, fun tune. Um, it's impossible not to get caught up in the vibe of, of Splanky. It's a great tune. And um, it even ends with a, another original by McBride. Um, most, of the, most of the tracks are original, actually. Um, and called, there's a track called Night Train, which it ends on, which is um, McBride's solo bass piece, which I love. Oh, man, that's gr it's great stuff. Um, and, you know, that with the, with the bass trio, the upright bass trio with Ray Brown and Milt Hinton, and then mix in the other tracks, you know, with the five or six-piece band. Um, the six-piece band, you know, with trumpet, trombone, piano, and all that stuff. And there's a nice variation in there. But for some reason, I'm really drawn to those bass tracks, the one solo bass track and the trio with, with Ray Brown and Milt Hinton. And, yeah, I was, you know, it, it's weird that you sent me this because um, I just recently, again, came across a couple things that I hadn't listened to for years with um, Ray Brown on bass. And, you know, just another reminder that, I very much got into listening to to Ray Brown and the associated people that he played with when Ray Brown was still alive, you know, and it was and I, I don't think I found out that he passed away until a couple of years after he passed. Um, kind of, you know, kind of sad, you know, another guy that I got into when he was very much not only alive, but still still musically active. And, um, you know, I got a bunch of things with him on it. Um, OK. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a couple classical discs here that um, I might get confused with each other. I have to give this one another. I know I played this a couple times, um, Elgar's Cello Concerto. And I remember hearing stuff that I liked, but I was kind of um, not fully tuned in at the time. So this is probably the next thing tonight that's going to get a really close listen. Um, there's a couple classical albums here that I didn't tune in to realize which specific album I was listening to. And this is one of them, but I didn't hear anything that didn't resonate with me. And um, it, it's uh, Ed, Ed, Edward or Edvard Elgar, who died in 1934, um, doing the cello concerto in E minor and something called um, C Pictures, which has a vocalist, uh, you know, a, a female operatic style vocalist uh the london symphony orchestra i do remember hearing the vocalist but i think i think i think that the piece that andrew is really referring to is the cello concerto in e minor um which takes up more than half of the album um and that's the piece i really have to give a close listen to i think i'm really going to dig it because i like i said i was playing these all in a in a playlist so i didn't necessarily know when one ended and the uh, and the next one began but I do remember hearing the, the, the operatic vocals come in. Um, so that's got to get a really close listen to tonight. Here's one I didn't have, Coltrane. You know, I never picked up my favorite things, even in vinyl. And this is a nice addition. It's got the four tracks for my favorite things. You know, it's got the booklet in there. It's one of the special editions. But as, as bonus tracks, it's, it's got about five minutes of bonus tracks. But the interesting thing, something I didn't realize is they kind of edited my favorite things, which goes on for like is that either 11 or 13 minutes. I can't remember which one now. Um, they edited it down into a single. So they've got this like two minute and 40 second A side single version of my favorite things. And then they included the B side, which is a different edit of about three minutes of my favorite things, which they included on the album. So I was totally unaware that they included that there was even a single done of my favorite things. And I have to wonder if it got radio play. You know, there's not much in two minutes and 40 seconds, you know, there's not much time outside this just to state the theme, you know, but it kind of reminds me. And, and of course, but this was edited strictly from the longer version. So it's kind of different than like when the West Montgomery did the radio friendly tunes that were, you know, like under three minutes or right around there. Those tracks were written specifically for that length. In this case, they tried to extract the single out of this and made it playable on. I wonder if that ever got played on radio. Um, and um, here's another classic album, one I didn't have. 
and the cover that I've always looked at and liked. Thelonious Monk's, Monk's music. And, and one of the reasons that I didn't pick this up is because I generally prefer to listen to Monk or, or most musicians actually in a smaller ensemble, trio or solo or whatever. And this has a fairly large horn, well, a, a bigger band. It's got Art Blakey on drums. This is a classic session from 1957. Wilbur Ware on bass, um, Thelonious Monk on piano, and it's got four horn players, Ray Copeland on trumpet, Gigi Grice on alto sax, Coleman Hawkins and John Coltrane both on tenor saxophones. So I've always kind of steered away from, for whatever reason, um, more than one horn in a Thelonious Monk band. And I've always tended to listen to things that were pretty much him being the the sole melodic instrument or whatever, just, just the piano. Um, and what I notice now, and what I've always thought about his music, and I still think about it, you have to really be in the mood for it. His music is so angular and kind of spiky, and, you know, if you know Monk, you know his oddball themes. Um, no mistaking him for anybody else. And you have to be in the mood to listen to him. But when I put this on, um, with the horns and with the fantastic recording quality at Van Gelder Studios. No, I'm sorry, this one wasn't a Van Gelder original. Some of the others were. Um, and th no less than three bonus tracks. Um, it, it dawned on me, and I've never heard these, but I've heard the, the tracks that he's recorded before. Epistrophe, uh, Ruby My Dear, Well You Needn't. Uh, which got a lot of versions out there, and that's an 11 and a half minute version of Well You Needn't on here. Most of the tracks I already knew the themes. I'd never heard them played in an ensemble with this many horns. Fantastic recording. The interesting thing is actually they were very careful with the arrangements, and it, it strikes me that actually his music is easier to get into with this larger ensemble. Um, it seems like even though all those angular, spiky, odd, melodic qualities are obviously still there because he's playing the same tunes. There's something that's softened about them by having the horn section. It's a highly arranged thing. I mean, they do solos and everything. But if you were to introduce somebody to Monk's music, this might not be a bad place to start because for some reason it doesn't come off sounding as unusual with these horns in there. It's really interesting. I've always loved that album cover. There used to be, um, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, uh, these books that came out. You get a standard bookstore. One was the Encyclopedia of Rock, and the other one was the Encyclopedia of Jazz. I don't know if there was an Encyclopedia of Classical Music. And they would redo them and update them and come out with new editions every few years. And it was a soft cover book, but it was a really fairly thick book. And I didn't keep my copies of them when I moved. Um, and they were, uh, what they were is soft cover, very big book, like uh, the size of the old Rolling Stone magazine, the full size, really big. Um, and they would give a brief history of the most important musicians in, you know, in the case of rock or jazz music, whatever that book focused on. And they would give a, a brief rundown, brief rundown of personnel changes, what their most popular songs were, um, show you pictures, a lot of pictures of the album covers. One of the editions, I'm pretty sure they used this photo on the, for the Encyclopedia of Jazz. I remember this photo really, and it was either on the actual cover of the Encyclopedia Jazz, one of the versions, or it was a full-page reproduction of just this cover of him in the wagon there. I'll never forget that. And shortly after that edition came out, it was when the OJC original jazz classics started, when they started reissuing the albums in the original album cover, and then it was the first time that I actually saw this LP um, in the stores on the OJC, um, being reissued with the original cover because they had done reissues over the years and changed the cover and then they went back to the original packaging uh, back in the, so it was the early, very early 80s they did that and I remember seeing this in the stores always loved that cover it's just weird because I never expected that I would be that interested in um, a bigger band Thelonious Monk album and yet it's weird because I find this one a lot easier to listen to with all the horns in there than listening to him solo or in trio format, which is pretty much how I always listen to him. 
Uh, here's another one. I've never had a solo album by Jackie McLean, great saxophone player. Um, and this is a really, really, really good album. As a matter of fact, I, I would, you know, for people that are, aren't into mainstream jazz, obviously it's an acoustic session. It's a blue note. It's from um, a few months before I was born in 1959. This is actually recorded here in New Jersey at Van Gelder Studios. Um, it's interesting. The first, what was originally the first slide is pretty pure acoustic jazz like you would expect. Um, Jackie McLean on saxophone, Donald Byrd on trumpet, Walter Davis Jr. on piano, uh, Paul Chambers on bass, and Pete LaRocca on drums. So it's all jazz giants pretty much. Um, great band, great recording sounding thing. Uh, first slide is, is uh, two Jack and McLean pieces, very much pure acoustic kind of beboppy jazz or post bop. But what was the second slide are, are pieces by Walter Davis Jr. and, and uh, a bonus track also by Walter Davis Jr. Um, and the, the pianist on the session. And those are very, very hip. They must have sounded actually accessible and commercial at the time because he, instead of doing the bebop and the swing and the, and the typical jazz rhythms, he used this kind of um, more grooving rhythms um, on his pieces. And I think there are things that people that aren't really into acoustic jazz or that are just kind of wetting their appetites in this world could really appreciate. The Walter Davis Jr. pieces, really fantastic. Um, well recorded, certainly going to get a lot of plays um, for me. Uh, Henry Threadgill, another guy. I don't have anything of him by, as a leader. I've heard him as um, a sideman. Had no idea that he was this expansive um, in his solo stuff. I always kind of figured him to be more of a, 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 a mainstream oriented guy that kind of expanded out into maybe like free jazz and more modern forms of jazz. But this album knocks my socks off when I heard it. Um, it's a fairly large band on here, but it's not a big band jazz record. If anything, it actually sounds more like a jazz orchestra. Well, there's solos on here. And there's moments where you can tell the musicians are improvising. For the most part, though, um, oh, it's, it's called Carry the Day. Short album. It's only like 37 minutes. Um, you can tell that the musicians are improvising. But most of this is really tightly written out things. And it has to be because it's such an unusual band. You've got Henry Threadgill, alto sax, bass flute and flute. You've got a French horn player, um, two guitarists. Uh, two tuba players, which is bizarre and interesting, a drummer, and there's guest percussionists. You've got the Wu Man playing pipa, or pipa, the, the Chinese stringed instrument. You've got an accordion in there, and you've got a couple vocalists on tracks, but the vocals don't detract because when the vocals come in, instead of being ten times louder than all the other instruments and all the other instruments fade in the background, they pretty much mix the vocals in like it was another instrument. And the vocals are not done in a song format thing when you can tell when they're going to come in because, oh, here's time for another verse. It's not like that. So the vocals really do work in the context of the music. Um, it's not like, oh, it's a vocal track. Let me get off. You know, let me get off and get on to the next thing. Uh, you know, the vocals come in. They're there for a little while. Then there's some instrumental stuff. You don't know when the vocals are going to come back, if they're going to come back. So it's, it really works. I was, you know, and the thing when I was listening to this, that it almost got me out of the music in a way. I realized how talented this guy is and what an imagination he is because I can't compare this to anything else. You know, it's it's essentially kind of a, a larger band with, you know, the French horns and guitars and tubas and percussions. And, you know, then you've got the occasional vocal or the pipa or the accordion. Um... But instead of sounding like a bigger jazz band, it actually sounds more classically like an orchestra. And I had no idea Henry Threadgill was this talented, to be honest with you. It's really hard to describe. It's really unlike anything else. I wonder if maybe on YouTube somebody's uploaded this so you guys can hear it. Um, really, really 
find interesting. I had no idea he was so original. Um, and I think of all the talent and the time that it would take to write these pieces and how few people probably will ever hear this is so uncommercial, this music. And, you know, so beyond probably selling more than a few thousand copies. It's such a shame that, you know, I don't even think the jazz stations would play this, sadly. That, you know, if I wasn't aware of this, <laughs> most of the world isn't. Um, really, I'm just so impressed by his talent. Two more to go. Um, here's a band that I heard of, an 80s band, Dead Can Dance. I think I heard one track from them once. I always thought they were an 80s band. I knew that they, um, I knew Lisa Gerard the singer because she worked with Klaus Schultz. I'd heard of the band. By the time they came along in the late 80s, I was out of listening to any kind of popular music. I knew they were kind of like a popular band that got more esoteric, kind of. But I never really went and, and seek them out for anything. Um, Maybe I heard one track somewhere, but now I'm not even sure. And I kind of thought they'd be one of those bands that use like a lot of drum machine and, and stuff like that. And I was totally wrong. This isn't, uh, this is their fourth album, I believe I read. Um, they probably started off a bit more mainstream. But by the time they got to this album, there's really nothing in here that you would call rock, or, you know, really. Um, the instrumentation sounds very pure and acoustic, even if they're using electronic instruments. Uh, the vocals are both male and female. Um, really atmospheric. This is such a fantastic record. I have no idea. When I heard the first track, I'm like, wow, that's really good. I'm sure the rest of the album won't measure up to this. There's male vocals, which are more like chants, and there's female vocals, which are more like chants. And oddly, I was so impressed by this. And the closest thing that it recalls for me, and this is from 88, I think, 1988. Um, it actually recalled, I, I talked a while ago about um, Greek, uh, ancient, music from ancient Greece. And there's a, a few different music from ancient Greece albums. Um, and most of them use ethnic instruments, you know, unusual stringed instruments that were from those times that aren't really used and aren't really around today. And there's a couple, the only differences from the albums I've heard from the music from ancient Greece are um, some are more instrumentally oriented, some are a bit more vocal oriented. Either way, they're very atmospheric. And this reminded me of, and this is a huge compliment, this reminds me of the more vocally oriented music from ancient Greece albums, the way it's um, recorded, the sound of the instruments. There's no drum machines on here um, banging out a beat. Um, God, it's a fantastic album. And I really think that probably a lot of the VC members already, they certainly know the band. I don't know if they know this album or how representative this album is. But I would think that most of the VC people that watch my videos would love this. This is, this is fantastic. Um, basically, it's a two-member band. Uh, a guy, I forget the guy's name, you know, and, and I guess he decides the musical direction and Lisa Gerard. Um, and the last thing that's playing in the background, this was another interesting, Bella Bartok. Um, here's, again, something I would never pick up for myself. Love Bartok, love the uh, unusual aspect of his music, you know, his writing was, again, he's not one of those, he's known for being a little bit um, like Prokofiev or, you know, somebody that's a little bit uh, experimental is not the right word, modern. I wouldn't have picked this up only because it's a, um, a string quartet. And I don't really like string quartets because I find them very limiting because it's usually um, cello, viola, and two violins. All those musical instruments are in the same family. They sound very much alike. They're just pitched differently. And there's not enough variation in mood and sound for me in most, um, in most string quartets. So I tend to avoid string quartet stuff when I buy music. Um, so I wouldn't have picked this up. And, I've, and I'm talking about, like, there's some of my favorite composers have written string quartets, and I picked them up simply because they were my favorite composers. And even those things didn't do it for me. This was or is fantastic. I don't know how it was done. There is something in the way this was recorded or the way it's written or both that exceeds the limitations of the string quartet. It actually sounds like a full orchestra at times when they're sometimes they're plucking the strings. Um, unfortunately, at 37 minutes, it's very short. But I have to tell you, just now, I've listened to this about four times. This could be easily 
my favorite string quartet music I have ever heard in my favorite recording. This is really fantastic. Um, two pieces, one from 1927, one from 1928. Um, appears it was recorded, this actual recording is from 1972, it looks like. Um, you know, standard two violins, um, violin cello, so I guess it's cello, and it says alto. Um, I'm wondering if the alto could be a, really a viola or something. Um, but because of the limitations of the range of the string quartet, I've never been a big fan of them. But maybe it's the music itself. There's a lot of variety in here in terms of the sounds that come out. It's in the background. You probably can't tell because it gets so quiet at times. Um, but this is absolutely fantastic. And here's another one that's going to, you know, it's changed my mind a bit about string quartets and just a fantastic thing. And Andrew probably figured out oh, maybe Gary would be interested in it. And yet it's, it's wow, this is really something. Um, can't, it's not incredibly avant-garde or experimental, but it's um, it avoids that samey sound that most string quartets have because of the limited instrumentation. Really fantastic. Um, and highly recommended. He, Andrew also said, I gotta thank you, buddy, I owe you for this. Um, he said a couple classic things from Tower, Classical Pulse, from sending a note on here. These used to be free at Tower Records. I remember well. They had a couple magazines. They had the classical, and then they had the popular music version. Um, classical Pulse, you know, which was in their, strictly in their classical section. Uh, when I finally got Tower Records by me, which we, I didn't get to the late 90s, and it was there for like four years, and that was it. Um, I guess because New York City was so close that they didn't open one in New Jersey until very late in their history. And um, they finally opened it up, a store in, in New Jersey by where I worked and lived. And um, after a couple of years, they expanded and they bought the store next door, which was a smaller store. And they had their, they, they had the store next door as their classical annex. And it was just classical music. And the jazz, the new age, the rock, the pop, the, the hip hop, everything else was in the main store. And that only lasted for like a, maybe a year or two. And then they got rid of that store and they moved the classical stuff back into the main store. <laughs> and then a year later they were gone. During those couple of years that the classical annex was there, what a great place to walk into because if you walked into the main store, you would hear pop music of some type. Going to the classical annex, being a separate building, there was all this atmospheric classical music and they would play some unusual stuff in there. Nothing better on a Friday or Saturday night, walking into the classical annex, and I would pretty much go to buy experimental stuff, look for modern composers and stuff like that. Um, and just seeing this magazine brought back those memories. You'd walk in and it would be kind of dark outside and it'd be this brooding classical music playing in this classical annex. And, you know, everybody there was real intense music fans um, and just looking for unusual things. And the search was really fun because I don't know a lot about classical music. So, you know, when I looked for jazz, I would look for very specific things. Um, and classical music, I didn't. Um, and he also included Cadence Magazine. He said, this, this old New York magazine seems up your alley. Extensive interviews, the vast catalogs and recordings. Um, I remember Cadence. Here's a funny thing. Until Andrew, this, this is from, you can probably see it, March 1998. Um, but this magazine goes back much further. And I had completely forgotten about this magazine, which it's a nice thick magazine, you know, loaded with, you know, record reviews, what's new, um, you know, catalog, catalog listings mostly, um, but usually a real intensive artist interview. Um, this is one of those magazines that um, I can recall seeing, it's weird, I just wiped it out of my memory. As soon as I saw this, it's like, wow, yes. When I used to go shopping at, uh, you would see this in Tower Records and places like that, but where I recall seeing this the most are the mom and pop stores. The mom and pop record stores that I would go to that really didn't have a magazine section at all would carry just a couple magazines. I think Goldmine was one of them, which is a record collector's magazine, and Cadence was one of the others. 
And a lot of times they didn't even have any racks for magazines because they didn't really carry them. They only carried very specific, you know, recording-oriented things, record-oriented collector's things like this. And they would actually have them on the front counter because a lot of these stores were so small and so stuck for space that what they would do is just have these on the front counter for people to, so they'd be like, this gold mine might be the only two magazines that the entire store would sell. Um, just to, you know, and it just, just seeing this again, that Andrew sent in the package, uh, just triggered those, those memories that I'd forgotten. And a couple stores that I had forgotten I shopped in until I, until I saw this, thought, oh yeah, I used to see this on the counter on the way out when you were checking out of the store. Um, so Andrew, I, I owe you, buddy. I don't know what I could possibly send you to, you know, and I, I, I played all of these discs, total disc. It's just a couple minutes under eight hours of music. That's a whole lot. I created a playlist, the windows playlist with this music in there. Um, so I've got an entire playlist called, uh, Andrew's VCLT from, um, June, 2016 with the exact date on it that I received this stuff. So I can go into my computer, which is where I listen to all my music, at any time, click on this playlist, which will stay in my computer, and it automatically loads all 10 of the discs that Andrew sent me, and I can just play all 10 discs. And I'll never forget that, oh, this is where I got them, here's the date that I got them, and Andrew sent me this, you know, with, with the CD and the CD with the CD. Um, so I don't know, I've got, my phone keeps ringing, and this is more calls than I've gotten in a month. I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, so I just want to say, Andrew, thanks as videos overdue, but I, I really, really do prefer to, um, to, to listen to the music and comment a little bit on it, uh, before I film, otherwise I would never get to it. So thanks again. Sorry, this video went a bit long, but I really wanted to, you know, for anybody out there who might possibly be interested in picking up any of those albums, um, I really wanted to give a little description so you get an idea of what they're about. Um, you know, maybe wanting to pick them up yourself. And that entire Bar Talk CD played while I was talking because I told you it was only 37 minutes. Okay, guys, take care. I'll see you soon.